when Robin and I first got married, I was serving as the associate in Tahlequah, and as was protocol for United Methodist Churches at that time, the church had to provide a furnished parsonage for us to live in. So that was fine. We're newlywed, small house. It, it all worked out very nicely. But then uh, I got sent to Ada as a campus minister, and Ada did not provide a parsonage. They did what this church does. They actually just gave me a housing allowance. Now, the housing allowance they gave me was just enough to pay the rent. But guess what we didn't have? The furnishings. So we were having to buy furniture and borrow furniture until we could get our own furniture in the house. And about that time, Robin decided, you know, we should buy a house. Now, as a United Methodist pastor in our itinerant system, that's what we call the system of moving pastors around. In the itinerant system, I was just convinced if we bought a house, that would be the trigger that was pulled that meant I would have to move. And so I was reluctant from buying a house for a long time, but eventually we did find a house that we liked. It was built in 1920, uh, and, and so it needed a little updating. You understand that, right? Uh, I think we counted four layers of wallpaper that we scraped off the wall so we could texture the walls and, and repaint them. We pulled up all the carpet, and there were these beautiful hardwood floors that we had to strip and sand and stain and seal. Uh, you know, those were not skills I ever had, but hey, they come to you pretty easily should you ever need to do that. But there was one skill that I knew I did not have and I did not want to take on, and that was, you know, again, remember, this house was built in 1920. There was this thing with the indoor plumbing. No, no, we had indoor plumbing. It just, you know, we didn't have to run out to the privy or anything like that. But what we didn't have was a shower. Two bathrooms, but no shower. That meant we had to take a bath. Now, for some people, the idea of sitting in a hot tub may feel rather glorious. But I want to tell you, there is nothing glorious about having to take a bath every day. It is a downgrade. You want to, you, you know, you, you want to take a shower. That's what you're used to. And so we knew that someone was going to have to, you know, help us put the shower in. And it was going to be worth it because we really loved the house. We just needed to get the shower to complete what we wanted. With that in mind, brothers and sisters, I want to say thank you for, again, your patience, your cooperation, your help as our worship center is being remodeled. I do trust that while this may feel a little bit like taking a bath for a couple of months, I think the end product is going to be glorious. So thank you for that. If you've not heard, if you're a guest or you just haven't heard the news of our remodel, let me tell you what our vision for this is because it's very clear that or very important that we have a clear understanding of our vision. The thing we want to do is we're trying to uh, make our worship space even more sacred so that whenever we come into it, we do have that sense that we are coming in to express our love and our devotion for God. At the same time, we're trying to look at the practices of what is helpful to attracting families with children and youth. What are some things we need to do to move from a bathtub to a shower, if you will, to attract families while at the same time meeting the expectations of our current worshiping community. So that's what our, our vision is. And, and today we're going to start talking about what our theme for the year is and how it is this remodel is going to work into that. Okay, question, I, I want you to respond. In 2017, what was our theme? What was our emphasis as a church for the year? Prayer. Thank you for those of you bold enough to speak out. It, it was prayer. Well, here's what our focus is going to be on in 2018. Our focus this year is going to be on community. Now, some of y'all, if you've already gotten the T-shirts, you've already noticed, and you're saying, why did we change the name of the church? If you're looking at the vest that uh, Stephanie and I have on, that the worship team has on, you're saying, why did we change the name of the church? The answer to that is, we did not change the name of the church. What we did was we're using the full name of the church as it's always been. If you look at our articles of incorporation, the name of our church is St. Andrew's Community United Methodist Church. And so this year, one of the things that we're wanting to focus on, one of the things we're wanting to bring up is this idea of community. So in order to help you with this, I'm going to give you an image of what community is like. 
Are you ready? You're sure? Okay, good. Remember, you ask for it, and I'm going to give it. The image I want you to have for community is flypaper. I know you were expecting something much more spiritual, but let me explain this. Some of y'all may not know what flypaper is because y'all are city people, and like the only time I've ever really encountered flypaper is when I've gone fishing at some farm somewhere, and they're, you know, they got flypaper out because they want to get rid of those pesky flies. But that's what flypaper is. It is something that attracts and captures flies. Are y'all with me so far? Do I need to slow down? Okay, just making sure. You could actually Google it up, and you could learn how to make your own flypaper. You don't even have to go buy it. But if you're going to make your own flypaper, flypaper has two qualities that are very important for our understanding of community. The first quality is flypaper must be sweet. You catch more flies with than you do vinegar. Got to have something sweet. You've got to have something that is going to attract the flies. But once a fly is attracted to the flypaper, once it actually, you know, steps on the flypaper, then the second quality it has to have is flypaper must be sticky. It's got to have something that when that fly lands on it, it captures a fly, it does not let it go. Now, you can make your own flypaper. If it is sweet, you will attract a lot of flies. But if it is not sticky, the flypaper does not accomplish its purpose. It does not accomplish its mission. Hear me clearly, friends. When people walk into our newly remodeled worship space, I really hope one of the experiences that they have, that, that we all have when we look around, go, wow, this is really sweet. This is something that is really attractive. This is a place that people will want to come, and they'll feel that devotion to God that, that we hope all people experience when they come here. But that can be as sweet as it wants, but if it's not sticky... We do not accomplish our mission as a church. It's not about how we look. We want to attract people, but we want people to stick around. And so as we think of community and we think of being an attractive place that people want to stick around and make their spiritual home, I think we can go back to that first century, that first generation of Christian people who really had a very high level of what it meant to live in authentic community and learn from them the same things that will be helpful to us. So, uh, if you'll just follow along on the screen, I'll read the scripture today. Okay, uh, so here's the deal I've made the other two services. And that is, since I know that we are conditioned to following the scripture on the screen, I want you to get in the habit of bringing a Bible to church with you as we read the scriptures. Uh, and, and my thing will be, I will be reading out of the NIV. So if you want to know what translation I have, New International Version is the translation I have. But for those of you that are tech savvy, go ahead and pull up Acts 2 NIV on your phones and let's read the word of the Lord for the day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Okay, so if community needs to be both sweet and sticky, what is it about this first century, this first generation of Christians that is both sweet and sticky? The sweet part for me is very easy to understand, and that is the sweetness of was the good news. So long people had believed God was angry and so long people believed that God didn't care about them. And so they, they walked around carrying this heavy burden. They, the, the practice of their faith almost felt oppressive. 
But the reality is, even though our sin separates us from God, the good news is that God took on human flesh, lived as a man by the name of Jesus, who suffered a horrific death on our behalf to pay the debt of our sin. But then glory, do I hear a glory this morning? Glory, on the third day he rose from the dead and that is the basis of our hope for salvation and eternal life. And now, as of Acts 2, these people are now living differently, not just because of Jesus, but because they have experienced the power and presence and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That is the sweet. What we want to focus on is what then makes it stick. You can share good news with people that they're attracted to, and sometimes we see people, it's like a, you know, you know the parable of the, the sower that some of the seed is, is put on rocky ground and it springs up fast, but it has no root, and so it dies very quickly. We can attract people, but how do we get it to stick? How, how, how did this first century of people who were persecuted, who were beaten, who were enslaved, who were tortured for their devotion to Jesus, what was it that made them a spirit-filled, spirit-led, spirit-empowered people that were willing to pay the price of sharing the good news with their lives? You can count as many of these as you want. I'm just going to give you six today. They're on the back of your bulletin. I'll let you know when we get there because you can't read it on the screen. But let me tell you what I think the key to their community was. I think the key was devotion. That first part of the scripture, it says they devoted themselves. And we're going to look at things that they were devoted to that helped to make authentic Christian community. All right, y'all ready? Y'all need a stretch break or anything? Okay, good. So the first thing it says is they were devoted to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. Let's break that down just a little bit. First of all, let's remember who are the apostles? Well, Peter, James, John, our favorite, Andrew. It, it was those 12, less Judas, because he had killed himself, filled his spot with a guy by the name of Mattathias, the 12 apostles, the 12 disciples that were with Jesus. And as people were coming to faith, as they were coming to hear the sweet good news of salvation to all people, they would come so the apostles could teach. The question is then, if that's who the apostles were, what did they teach? Well, it depends on the audience. You see, it said that they went in the temple courts every day. Who was hanging out in the temple? Jews, thank you. Again, I ask you a question. Sometimes it's okay to respond out loud. That, that'll let me know you're awake. But the, it was the Jews. The Jews would go to the temple. And the apostles were themselves Jewish men who believed Jesus was Messiah. So when they were teaching in the temple courts, what do you think they were trying to teach people? They were trying to teach them Jesus is the Messiah. They would go back into what we call the Old Testament. They called it the law and the prophets. And they would walk them through the law and the prophets and showed how those things were fulfilled in Jesus. And Jesus is the Messiah. That's what they were trying to teach them, and it says every day there were more and more that were coming to believe that. But as the good news spread, it could not be contained just among the Jewish people. It also spread to the non-Jewish people, the Gentiles. And so for the Gentiles, if they were religious at all, they were probably worshiping Greek and Roman mythologies, had all these gods that you had to keep you know, happy or they were going to mess you up. And so to lay a foundation of faith in their life, what do you think they taught? They probably went back to the law and said, you think there's many gods, but the foundation of our faith is here, O people, the Lord is one. In other words, they were committed to apostolic teaching. And then it says they were committed to fellowship. And the Greek word that we translate fellowship there is actually a word that is the hardest to pronounce Sunday school class name in our church. And that is the word koinonia. But you know, there's actually a better translation of the word koinonia than fellowship. Anyone want to guess what it is? Community. They were committed to apostolic teaching and to community, to koinonia. Now, 
Brothers and sisters, the reality is if you want to be part of authentic community, you're going to have to have that aspect of your personal devotion of what you're doing, but devotion happens best in community. So we're going to encourage you to be active in a daily devotional time. Y'all understand, you know, we're talking about reading the scriptures and praying and thinking about thoughts of God. You know, one of the disciplines I have, this is not to boast, it's just an example, is I make it a goal every year to read the Bible, Genesis through Revelation. One of the reasons I do that is because if I don't have that goal, I really don't read the Bible except for when I'm preparing sermons. And so if that's all I'm doing, then what I am able to bring to our community of faith is not going to be as strong because my personal devotion is too weak. If you want to bring yourself into an authentic community where you're offering your best, you've got to be committed to discipleship. That's the answer to the first blank for those of you that are keeping score. They were committed to discipleship. We always tell people at Coffee with the Pastor, the maximum benefit you will get from this church is directly dependent upon your activity in discipleship. What Sunday school class do you go to? What small group do you participate? What midweek class? What Bible study do you have where you are learning and growing in your understanding of apostolic teaching? If you're here and you're not a part of a group, there's that insert in your bulletin this morning that shows some of the midweek classes I cannot tell you enough how important it is that for us to be strong, we have to be active in our discipleship. The second thing that it says is they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Now, Bible scholars actually are divided on what this means. Some scholars think it's a reference to the Lord's table, to breaking bread, because Jesus said, do this as often as you will to remember me. Others believe, because it says that they were meeting in homes, that this is actually biblical evidence of covered dish suppers in the church. (laughs) That they were meeting in homes and they were breaking bread, just a colloquial term to say that they were eating together. I'm not going to try to answer that question for us. Whatever one of those conclusions you come to, they both have a common link in the midst of it. And that is the breaking of bread should remind us about hospitality. You see, a lot of these early believers were poor. And whenever they gathered in someone's home, whose house do you gather in if you're going to have a crowd? Whoever has the biggest house. There were some wealthy people, and and wealthy people would welcome the poor. There, There was no division. There was no distinction necessarily about that. They were just all offered hospitality. Now, if you want to talk about a sticky subject... If you want to talk about how to get people to stick whenever they have a good experience in the church, I can assure you hospitality is key. If you want to get rid of people, be inhospitable. Give them the eye. (laughs) You're sitting in my chair. (laughs) I guarantee you, you do that, they will never come back. Not the kind of church we want to be, amen? I think hospitality is like the easiest thing for us to practice as a church. You know, if you want to know how do you get these vests, our greeters got them. And to me, the easiest thing that happens in the church is to have a ministry where you're just welcoming everybody, people you know, people you don't know, letting them know you're glad you're here. One of the reasons that we have things with our church name, one of the reasons we wear name tags is so that when someone comes, if they have a need, that's just one of the ways that we can offer hospitality. If we have not already sought them out, they'll seek out somebody with a name tag and say, can you help me find that coffee? It sure smells good. Can can you show me where the nursery is? Can you direct me to the restroom? Hospitality is a critical component of helping people to stick. So in the early church, they practiced, number one, discipleship. Number two, hospitality. Number three, it says they were devoted to prayer. Now, personally, I feel like prayer is actually a part of discipleship, but for some reason, when Luke writes the book of Acts, he felt it was important to separate that out and say that these people got together and pray. Now, I know sometimes in the church, we get this reputation that that's all we do is pray. I actually had a friend, he's not a Christian, he you know, was like going to come to a small group I invited him to as long as we didn't do to him what we do to each other 
whatever that is. And, and, and I think he had the image that we just sat around and we held hands and sang kumbaya and, you know, and, and we prayed. And, 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 and prayer is an important part of what we do. But what do you think people were praying when they were meeting in homes and they're breaking bread? What do you think they were praying? Now, remember, these are new converts. The Lord was adding to their number daily. But something about prayer made them stick. You know what I think it was? It's an educated guess. I'll just be honest. It's educated guess. I think that when they were coming to faith in Christ and they would gather together to pray as a, a means of worship, all these new converts would say, we don't know how to pray. And I think the apostles who were teaching them probably said, man, we know what that's like. In fact, we didn't know how to pray, so we went to Jesus and we said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And Jesus said, whenever you pray, say, our Father who art in heaven. I think that's how they began to teach him to pray. Now, when they got together in their discipleship groups, and this is what happens in the church, you get together in your disciple groups, that's when you get more intimate in your prayer. That's when you look at someone and say, you know, my dad's not doing very well. His health is not good. Will y'all pray with me about this? I think that's when you find someone that says, you know, my, my kid's really struggling, and, and I just don't know what to do. We don't know what to do, and even when we do know what to do, we pray. Last year, one of the things we had was a prayer minister of the day that every day we wanted somebody in the church to commit themselves to praying for our church. Friends, if you're able, on your way out, go out that main entrance again. There on the table, prayer minister of the day. We want to continue to do that because it is something that we do that helps people to stick. So first is discipleship. Second, third, fourth is mission. They devoted themselves to mission. It says they gave to anyone as they had need. Now remember, there are poor people coming, but even the poor people were doing what they could to help other people. And as a church, one of the things that people want to know is that we're not just here for ourselves, but we are a people that is engaged in mission. Let's be clear. Mission does not happen in the church. It's not things we do for the church. Mission is what the church does outside of our walls so that we might glorify the name of God. We do this because Jesus said we need to do this because this is a way that we uh, show our love and affection for him is by clothing those who are naked, by giving water to the thirsty, by visiting those that are sick or in prison. We've got to be a church committed to mission. I'm kind of curious as you think through these things, what is your plan for discipleship? What is your plan for uh, hospitality, what is your plan for praying this year? What's your plan for mission? See, every discipleship group, every small group, every Bible study we have, we always say at least once, twice, you know, however often you can, you need to have a mission. You need to get out and, and, and do something. Some people go to Skyline and do things there. Some people go to the regional food bank and help with that. As a church, five years ago, we started the meal packaging program with what was called Stop Hunger Now, change its name to Rise Against Hunger. Do y'all know why we did that? I mean, obviously, it's a way of showing our faithfulness to what Christ has called us to do. And we packaged 250,000 meals in five years. But there was another reason we did it. And that reason was because as a church, we were not very missional. We had people doing mission, but it was a relatively small group. And we wanted everybody to understand part of being a disciple of Jesus is being active in mission. And we thought if we bring it to the church and we do it here and we take away everybody's excuses, then everybody in our church can be involved in mission. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know if we're going to do that this year. The missions team is kind of weighing whether or not we're going to continue that based on how the response has been. Kind of the energy and the enthusiasm for it seems to be waning. So is there a better way for us to be involved in mission? Whatever they're doing, what is your plan? How will you devote yourself in mission on a personal level so that you can come together with the community of faith and we can all actively be involved in mission and do things that God has called us to do? Take a deep breath. Y'all look like you're holding your breath out there. All right, so first was discipleship. Second, third, fourth, fifth. Oh, I didn't give you that one yet. They devoted themselves to stewardship. 
It says that everybody sold all of their possessions and brought it to the apostles so it could be distributed to anyone as they had need. Now, the reality is, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, everything that you have comes from him and belongs to him. You're simply managing his affairs. But I want to give you some good news this morning. I'm not asking everybody to go sell everything you have and bring it here. I'm just going to ask for 10%. Because as a church, that's what we believe the Bible teaches, that a standard of giving back to God what God has blessed us with is a standard of the tithe, 10%. Now, obviously I want to say what's your plan for stewardship for this year, but I already know the answer to that because we had our stewardship campaign last October. And so I already know what you're given. The question I want to ask you is, do you find yourself living faithfully at a point where you're meeting that standard of 10%? I'm not going to beat you up with it. just want to ask you. If I'm asking you to be involved in discipleship and mission and prayer, I'm going to ask you to be involved in being good stewards of what God has blessed us with. All right, so there's just one more. I said six, right? Okay, so first is discipleship. Second, third, fourth, fifth. The sixth one is they devoted themselves to worship. It said that they, they met together and they, they always had glad and sincere hearts and they were praising God all the time. Whenever we gather, this is our most important hour of the week because as a community, the sticky factor is that we come to experience the greatness of our God. Everything that we've talked about in some ways we can practice here except perhaps mission. That's something we would practice afterwards. But friends, worship, if this is the only hour all week that you worship, oh, what a tremendous thing you are missing in your life. We, we, we bring ourselves into that place where we go to that secret unseen place and pray and we begin to worship and, and pour out our hearts and have that face-to-face -face time with God. And when we are worshiping in our homes and in our cars and in our daily lives, then when we gather as a community how much greater to know it's not just me. There's other people that think, how great is our God? In fact, let's sing it together. How great is our God? Let's tell it, oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder, I consider all the worlds our heads have made. You can sing that in your car, and you probably scare the people driving next to you. But when we do it together, we feel like we have been exalted into heaven and singing with the angels. Amen? You see, this sense of community is we do all these things on a personal level, but we come together in koinonia, in community. And here's what I want us to understand. As we prepare to move into new worship space, our hope is that it is going to be attractive to people, and we want it to stick. And so this is what I want to share with you. It's a principle I heard years ago that I've always held on to and I try to practice, and that is if you want to get a house full of people, you hear me? If you want to get a house full of people, you got to get a people full of God. If we want a house full of people, we've got to raise our level of commitment to who God is and raise our level of living together in authentic community because life happens best that way. Do I have a witness? Can somebody say amen? amen. This morning we come to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And we issue this invitation as Christ's hospitality to all people. You don't have to be a member of this church. You don't have to be a member of our church. But the invitation is, if you truly and earnestly repent of your sins and you're willing to lead a new life following the commands of God, then draw near by faith and receive this sacrament to yourself. As you're able, brothers and sisters, let me invite you to stand and if necessary, turn to page two in your hymnal and let's affirm our faith together. <laughs> Let's join together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The scriptures teach us that whenever we come to the Lord's table, we do not come in an unworthy manner, that surely we must examine our hearts and confess our sin. Without projection, we don't have a community uh, prayer that we can pray together. So let me invite you where you are to take a moment for silent confession. Hear the good news. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. We remember how our Lord took bread as he was with his disciples. He gave thanks for it. And then he broke the bread and he gave it to them and said, This is my body which is broken for you. Take, eat in remembrance of me. After the supper... He took the cup and he gave thanks for it and he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my blood poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from this as often as you will in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Holy God, we ask that you would pour your spirit out on this bread and on this cup and make them be for us your body and your blood so that we might be your body redeemed by your blood we ask that your spirit would make us one with christ one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until you come back in final victory on that day we will gather with the saints of old and together with them we will feast around your heavenly banquet table together with them declaring that all honor and glory all power majesty and praise are yours with your holy spirit now and forever Amen. If you have never received Holy Communion at St. Andrews, all people are welcome. We ask that you come, that you would cup your hands. Someone will give you a piece of bread and you'll dip the tip of that in the cup. Receive the sacrament to yourself. At this time, I want to invite those who are helping serve to come and be served. 